6, we were asked by a few folks on campus if we had heard about this Darwin Day worldwide celebration of evolution event, and we hadn't, or I hadn't, but I said it sounds fun. Um, so we did something very simple. Thank we you. booked a room, and we asked two of our biologists, um, a computer engineer and a philosopher from campus, this was Eugene Heath, Yasser Khalifa, Tom Nolan, <clears throat> um, and Jem Waldo. We just said, take 10 minutes and talk about evolution as it relates to your field and your teaching. And we put that on a poster, and we flooded the room. And it was a big event. And it was very clear that just having a small local event related to Darwin was something that had some energy. Since then, we've had lots of different events. Each year, we, we've celebrated uh, the power of evolutionary theory and the benefits that, it's, that it has brought to a modern understanding of things. Um, we also are now in the seventh annual uh, Evolutionary Studies Seminar Series, um, which is a speaker series that we have free and open to the public, bringing in uh, people who talk about evolution from lots of different perspectives. Um, with the idea of showing students how a powerful set of ideas, such as we find in evolutionary theory, can really help us understand lots of different kinds of phenomena. So thank you for coming. Um, and we also will have two other events that will be part of our Darwin Week celebration that we're calling it this, this year. It's Charles's 205th birthday, so it's kind of special. Um, tomorrow at 7 o'clock? Tomorrow at 7.30 in the sub room, 208 is going to be the a meeting of the Evolutionary Studies Club. Um, Brianna Tauber is the president of the club. And uh, we have flyers. Do I have a flyer? Yes. They made awesome green flyers for you. And if you look closely, there's dinosaurs in the flyer, <laughs> right? Um, so check that out if you are interested in the club, which meets and discusses uh, evolution and shows videos and supports events such as this. Um, you should come, and there's going to be free pizza as well. Um, so, and additionally, on Wednesday, we will have a renowned horticulturist um, from Utah, Bill Varga, come, and he is going to talk about adaptations in desert plants, and that will be on Wednesday uh, in CSB Auditorium from 7 to 8. So I hope you are able to come to that as well. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, bring on Ken Nystrom from Anthropology, who's going to introduce our renowned speaker, Ralph Holloway. Good evening. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, like Glenn said, I am Ken Nystrom. I am the biological, sole biological anthropologist on campus, and I teach uh, human evolution or paleoanthropology, which Dr. Holloway uh, I use some of his material occasionally in my class, um, so it's really uh, a pleasure for me to introduce him. I have also, his research was required reading at my graduate school program for PhD qualifying, so it, it's a very kind of closing the loop kind of scenario for me tonight, so it's uh, uh, my great pleasure. Uh, he is a professor of anthropology at Columbia University and is widely recognized as the pioneer and a leader in the field of uh, looking at endocasts, or the, the casting of the inside of the cranium, and therefore the evolution of the human brain. Uh, he attended the University of New Mexico, graduating in uh, eight, 1959, and subsequently went on to get his PhD in anthropology from UC Berkeley in 1964. And after that, I believe he was at Columbia for the entire okay. time. Yeah. In the 1960s, he had an opportunity to travel to South Africa and examine in person some of the earliest australopithecine finds uh, and, and examine the endocast, particularly from one that's called the Tong uh, child or the Tong baby, which we'll, we'll learn about in class, um, who is an australopithecus africanus and has a natural endocast. Um, he was one of the first to really recognize that despite the, the fact that we're awfully proud of our very large brains, that it really requires more than just an increase in size to explain our cognitive abilities. And so the structural changes that accompany these increases in size are fundamental to explaining and discussing the evolution of the human brain. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ralph Holloway. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? No problem. Okay. Uh, so 
how did the human brain evolve? Uh, outside of getting into a time machine and going back and studying all the variation of all the populations there and getting all the behavior and dissecting them in the lab you know, and getting the genomics of them and so forth, we'll never know. Okay? So this is sort of a fantasy trip in a way. But it keeps me employed. I, I did put my kids through college and so forth. So how do you study it? There are indirect ways and there are direct ways. The indirect ways are comparative neuroscience, neurogenomics, and what I call the speculative side. You know. For example, uh, a speculation based on the cryptoform plate of the nasal apparatus has led to the speculation that Neanderthals could not smell as well as we did. And for those of you in evolutionary psychology, this is very important because it indicates uh, that their social skills were lower than ours. But it's a tantalizing, fantastic sort of thing to do. There is direct evidence, however, and that direct evidence is called paleoneurology, in which you study the inside of the crania uh, through the mechanism of an endocast. Now, I missed neurogenetics, neurogenomics, because that, at the present time, while it is indirect, may in the future hold the best, best chance for us understanding how the human brain evolved. Let's see if I can do this now. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about tonight are these seven issues, if we can get through it. Uh, the issue of LB1, Homo fluesiensis, um, this crazy thing that was found about 19, that lived about 19,000 years ago in Indonesia. Then the issue of brain reorganization. And finally, we will come down uh, to the size and reorganization as mosaic evolution. So the first thing to understand is what endocast cannot give you, okay? They can't tell you anything about internal structure. You don't, you will never know about the hypothalamus, the limbic lobe, the cytoarchitectonic, or the stages of myelinization in, let us say, a Neanderthal as opposed to ourselves. That's the way it is. Live with it. Okay? They will never tell you about the neurochemistry or the genomic DNA information because endocasts do not fossilize, despite what may happen in Florida. And any direct reading of behavior, such as intelligence, aggression, altruism, and so forth, uh, you can't find that located on an endocast. And that's a shame, because paleoneurology is really basically paleophrenology. If it hadn't been for Gaul, we would never have gotten anywhere with this. And, of course, the early stuff that Gaul did was very, very important and wasn't phrenology. But let's not kid ourselves. We look at an endocast and we look at the occipital lobes and we try and understand the parameters of vision as best we can by looking at it. We look at the frontal lobes, the prefrontal lobes, and we try to divine what the moral behavior might have been. In other words, we try to have fun sometimes. Okay. So here's the difference. I guess you've seen that in the publication. But on the top is what a brain actually looks like once you strip it of those three meningeal tissues. You get rid of the pia matter, the arachnoid tissue, and the dura matter, and that's what you see. And you can name all of those gyri and sulky. Now, that brain resided in the skull, and this endocast underneath it is from that same skull. Okay? Neat, huh? I, now you see the agony of paleomorology. Okay? Well, can you, you know, I mean, that's why in 19, 
64 when I finished my dissertation, I, I thought, oh no, don't go into paleoneurology. Point made, right? So what can they do, these things? Well, they can tell you size, thanks to Archimedes. All you have to do is take this undercast, make sure it doesn't leak somewhere, okay, and put it in a beaker of water that has a little spout attached to it. The water comes out, you put it in another beaker, you put it on a scale, and thank God, because water has a specific gravity of one, you now know how much that endocast displaced in terms of volume. Very simple. I, it, it, it makes me very pleased on Sundays to do that. You can analyze the shape. There are many, many sophisticated morphometric methods now that will tell you whether Broca's regions are slightly enlarged in a lateral sense. Uh, relative to the size of the endocast, things of that nature, which may be, give us important clues as to how the endocast might have changed through time. Okay? Occasionally, as you did not see in the previous slide, you do get sulcal and gyral landmarks. That particular slide I showed you showed not a zip. You know. But if you look at some of the Homo erectus endocasts, you can get a lot of detail on the frontal lobes. If you look at the tongue specimen, there's quite a bit of detail on them. Um, Neanderthals, unfortunately, do not give very much detail. And modern Homo doesn't tend to give you much detail either. But this varies in different, kind, in different populations. Nevertheless, occasionally, you do get to see a gyrus and a sulcus. And that's where the controversies come into play. You can get a little bit of sense of the organization, such as a reduction in visual cortex, possible cortical asymmetries related to handedness and cognition, uh, like right-left petalia patterns that you find in the various sides of the cerebral cortex. And then there are things like the meninges, uh, which supply the dura mater in particular, and have absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with brain function. Okay? They are on the, do not supply the, the brain in any way, only the dura. So some of the issues are, that we're going to look at are LB1 homofluoresiensis. Is it pathology or is it a new species? Uh, I seem to be one of the few people out in the world who thinks it might possibly be pathological. So uh, I'm a pariah in many circles. Other people think it's a new species. Personally, I have to admit that I am sitting on a fence over this issue, and I'm straddling that fence, and about 75% of my body is leaning toward the new species hypothesis. But it seems like a good scientific effort to see if you can at least test the hypotheses that it might have been pathological. Um, so here we have this endocast. Oh no, okay. I just want to indicate that uh, the original work was done by my colleague, Dean Falk, and was published uh, back around 2004, I think, in uh, Science. Um, and they had a CT scan, uh, and I finally was able to persuade Mike Norwood, who has now passed away, uh, to let me have a copy of the CT scan. I'll be talking about that in a minute. So. A crucial part of science is replication. Can I replicate what Dean Falk found? Uh, and that's the main issue here. So from Falk, oh, it was 2005, sorry. Okay, what you see are, is the virtual undercast uh, from the CT scan data uh, that Falk and the colleagues put together. So on the top you, you have to the left, 
you have a left lateral side, you have the occipital view, and then when you come down below it, you have the frontal view, and the artist artistic renditions uh, that you see, ah, that's not going to work, uh, at the bottom sort of tell you where the cracks and the crevices are in this preparation. So it's a beautiful looking and the cast. The color is, I think, spectacular. You know? And the idea was, basically, uh, and let me go back to that. The idea basically is, if you look at the frontal lobes, you can see that the anterior frontal poles are very protruding. And that led to the idea uh, that being area 10 of Grodman in particular, uh, the frontal poles, that uh, Homo floresiensis was particularly gifted cognitively. More about that in a minute. Okay. So here is a CT scan which shows you what they were actually dealing with in making this virtual endocast. Okay. As you can see, there's some very important cracks and fissures in there that had to be corrected for. You had deformations. Uh, you had missing parts and so forth. And so the virtual endocast and so forth really reflects in part the skill and the decisions that are made by the person making the endocast. And this is very important to keep in mind. So, when we got the CT scan data, I, I put it through a, a program called ITK Snap, which is freeware, and Tom did it through Analyze, and this is from figure three of Falk. Uh, and this just sort of gives you an idea somewhat, you know, that you can get slight differences and so forth in the morphology and the shape overall shape by using different methods or different people doing the same thing, supposedly. Now, Tom and I are extremely close, of course, and we're, we're not that far removed from what Falk and the colleagues did either, as you should expect from CT scan data. Okay. So what this shows is we had two endocasts. Uh, one that we received from, made out of um, the CT scan data itself. Um, actually, I have to back up a bit. I was able to receive um, a cast of the skull, inside of the skull, from Peter Brown. And I was able then to make a direct endocast using latex rubber from that inside of the skull. And that is really what is on top. And that the first time the cast that was really made uh, gave us a volume of something like 385 cc's. The second endocast is really from Falk that we got, and that is given the volume of 432. And as you can see, uh, there are some differences in the shape. Now, Tom. Sherman and this is at, at Indiana University is, is just the whiz with the computer and statistics and so forth. And what this is trying to show are patterns of mismatch between those LB1 endocasts that we got. So when you're at, at the right end of things where you see that yellow and so forth, that's where the differences are most pronounced in the shape between those two endocasts. And this gives us some way of gauging quantitatively what those techniques yielded in that case, okay? Um, red, not much. And as you would expect from the endocasts, uh, this central axis portion uh, is where the most deformation has taken place uh, in the original fossil. Okay, this is what it looks like in the dorsal view. I put that up. Where the ruler is, you see those little knobby points in the green one and the white one? Those are uh, the prefrontal parts of the brain, and those are 
the gyri recti, which are sticking out, according to Falk and her colleagues, in a very pronounced way. Now, I just put this up here. The endocast on the left-hand side uh, is a rendition from Falk's uh, endocast, and the one on the right-hand side is mine from the actual skull thing. Okay. Well, back at the, I was struck by this picture when I first saw it around 2005, and on the right-hand side is a horizontal section through a microcephalic brain. Okay? The one on the left hand is a normal human being with a transverse section going across. And it shows that the frontal lobes are up on the top superior portion of it. And what struck me on this microcephalic at that time was the pointedness of those prefrontal parts of the microcephalic brain. I thought, wow, I mean, that, that it seems really similar. And I guess that is sort of what started me thinking, you know, we have to rule out the microcephaly question here. Because this is a little beast, you know, she's about three and a half feet tall, um, you know, with the brain size of a chimpanzee at roughly 400 cc's, you know. With this amazing looking brain, I won't talk about her legs and her feet, you know, which enabled her to flipper her way across the Indian Ocean to Indonesia. These are some chimpanzee and bonobo brains, endocasts that I've made over the time. Uh, on the right hand side, uh, you can see the, the Indonesian one, and the prefrontal lobes are facing down. I'm sorry about the one on the lower left hand side, it's been truncated. But if you take a close look, you know, I mean, you could make a case that those. Those prefrontal gyri recti are, are sort of substantial, you know, even in chimpanzees. Okay. This is Ethiops uh, on the left-hand side, Australopithecus Ethiopicus. LB1 is in the middle. And this is type 2 from Sturkfontein, uh, uh, an Australopithecine, Australopithecus africanus. And I only put this up to indicate that, you know, um, it's not that unusual to find a pretty prominent gyri recti even in some of the early fossils, fossil hominins. Okay. Now, this was supposed to be a slide that showed the differences in, in, uh, in millimeters, and we really go from something like 400 and, and 30, is that? to 404 to 383 and so forth. This is just to give you an idea of the range of variation that you get with the, the single endocast if you do it by slightly different methods. Okay. Now there was a wonderful uh, person by the name of Nicholas Ferry who was in one of the Polish courts back in the 18th century who spoke several languages uh, and he was uh, a nanocephalic dwarf. That is to say, his body uh, looked perfectly normal, but he was completely dwarfed, and he had a brain size roughly of 617 cc's. And what you should notice here, and I, I, wish, I wish we had a pointer, is that if you look to the right-hand side, you'll see the occipital lobe really overlaps uh, the cerebellum. LB1, you see the same thing. But those cerebellar lobes and the occipital lobe um, are following a modern pattern. If you look at a true microcephalic, this one from India, uh, what you see is the occipital lobes overhanging um, the cerebellum. Now, uh, one of the points that Falk likes to make is that in the case of the microcephalics, the cerebellum is always more posterior than the occipital lobes. And that simply isn't the case. This one shows that 
it's the normal pattern that you normally find in which the occipital lobes are more protruding posteriorly than the cerebellum. And this was the one that she ignored and refused to discuss in her papers. Nasty, wasn't it? So according to her article in 2009, uh, what you had were caudally positioned occipital lobe, lack of rostrally located lunate sulcus. <coughs> and what I'm sh trying to show here is that those in red can actually pretty much be found in most pongids. That is, you can find them in chimpanzee, you find them in bonobo, and you find them in orangutan, and you find them in gorilla. I won't go through all the statistics of it. The ones that you see in blue, uh, it's very hard to quantify those. So they might still be derived features. Okay. So we took uh, a measure of that was derived by Falk, uh, which sort of measured the breadth of the frontal lobe uh, relative to the amount of cerebellar protrusion uh, that you could measure on endocast. And we, we had a large sample of modern humans, around 80, and we only had about seven or eight microcephalics. Uh, and then we did this kind of thing using her ratios, and what we found in our microcephalic sample is that there was some overlap between LB1 and microcephaly. That didn't, does not prove that LB1 was a microcephalic. All it shows is that the morphometrics, if you have a large enough sample, will indicate some overlap. I'm still on the fence. So a small brain and how it scales the body side is, uh, in pathology is yet to be tested. Uh, and these are the issues that I think still need to be looked at more carefully by, you know, paleoneurologists, neurologists, whoever, you know, instead of just me. Okay. Uh, you do get a large degree of plagiocephaly, which is squatting squashing of the brain in the vertical dimension. Uh, and you do get very, very poor definition of broker caps in the third inferior frontal gyrus. But this at least gives you hopefully some idea of what this issue is about. Um, what will resetting the displaced elements yield? Will microscan data add any clarity to the convolutional details? And the answer is no. A paper was published recently by a Japanese team using micro CT scan data and it yielded no more information than the medical CT scan did. Okay? So now we move to the main thing that I've been concerned with over the last 40 or 50 years, which is reorganization of the brain and are there ways of looking at endocasts and perhaps learning something about the possibility of reorganization. By reorganization, all I mean are relative shifts in various parts of the brain relative to body to brain size that indicate that maybe the neural architecture inside of the brain has changed in some functional way. And what I'm really interested in one of the best ones uh, to be able to give you some idea of that is the infamous lunate sulcus. In all the anthropoids, the lunate sulcus is a crescentic sulcus that you find on the endocast or on the brain, okay, that separates primary visual strike cortex, Brodmann's area 17, from anteriorly placed parietal and temporal cortex, or what we know as, as association cortex. Area 17, as far as I'm aware, is purely sensory in function. Okay. And if you were to take uh, area 17 in a very large sample of primates, 
okay, and take the logarithm of the volume of it and the logarithm of the brain, subtract the, the things, the, the stride cortex first, of course, uh, and then draw a line through all of the primates, all 46 of them, you would find that the human point is about 121% less than you would expect on the basis of its brain size. Okay? 121%, that's sort of significant, isn't it? I mean, you know, I know statistics, you can get all wild sorts of things, but 121% is, you know, in, in there. If you do a lateral genicula, to which those fibers go from the calcium fissure, you know, it's 144% less than you would expect for a brain of that size. So what that is saying to me, at least, is if you're making comparative case here, the relative size, the relative size of the area 17, primary visual strike cortex, is reduced, relatively speaking, compared to other apes. And we assume that we have evolved somewhere from an ape ancestor. And in fact, Proconsul africanus uh, in the Miocene does have an endocast surface a bit, and it shows that the lunate sulcus is fairly anteriorly placed on the endocast. Okay. I had the pleasure of meeting Dart when I went to uh, South Africa to work on the Tonk specimen and other of these. Uh, Dart was enormously kind to me when I was a graduate student. Uh, he really nailed the concept of reorganization. Not me. It was really Dart who did that. And Grafton Elliott Smith before him. Uh, and uh, I was struggling at, at, at Berkeley under Professor Sherwood Washburn. Well, this is a whole new lecture. You know. uh, Anyway, uh, he didn't want me to study neuro neuroanatomy. And I was intrigued with all the stuff from South Africa, and I wrote to Dart from Berkeley, and I said, can you send me a couple of reprints of your, of your works and so forth? And about a month later arrives this box, filled with his reprints. I still have them. Wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. Anyway... Way back, uh, which led him to des describe the Tong thing, he felt that there was this huge expansion of tissue between the lunate and parallel or superior temporal sulcus. And that, he said, the distance three times as great as any existing endocast of a living ape skull. A very important thing. And what he did in 1925 was say that the lunate sulcus was in a relative relief posterior position. Okay. Now it gets a little dicey because I, uh, I really need the, a pointer at this point and you can't have one. Okay? But if you look at the tongue specimen on the right, do you see those white dots? Okay. Those white dots are where the lunate sulcus should be if this were just a ape. On the left hand side, is the chimpanzee brain cast that I have from Wally Walker. And it's very hard to see, uh, but if you, you should be able to see the lunate sulcus. Ah, see it here? Okay, wow. <laughs> Technology is, no. And, this is where it would be if it were an ape. What you know, should notice here, however, are there are some gyri that are going across here. And if you try and put this in a typical ape position, it's going to violate that morphology. You can't have it there. This is where Dart thought it was. And unfortunately, that's where the, the lambdoid suture is from the skull. And so there is always been this tendency possibly to confuse in many people's minds the lunate sulcus with the lambdoid suture. Up here, this little mark here, the dimple, that's where Dean Falk wanted to put it. And this is now in a circopithecoid position. Uh, 
Okay, this gives you a better view of it. Okay, as you can see there, Jerry, going across here, if you put this in a typical A position, uh, you're going to violate that morphology. Here's the lunate sulcus up here and the chimp, okay? And they're both around 400 cc's in terms of volume. And look at that. I mean, you can see gyri and sulci here uh, that you almost never find on other, other fossil hominins. It's really quite spectacular. And the idea was that there is this curvature right here and in this region here uh, that defines where the lunate sulcus would be. And that's why the idea is that the lunate sulcus was in a posterior, more human-like position in the Australopithecines, and that therefore the reorganization took place prior to the major enlargement in the size of the brain. Okay? Remember, this is 400 cc's. When we're going up to humans, we're going up three times that, that amount. Well, Falk and I have battled this thing and battled this thing. I think our major thing, without necessarily really coming to blows, um, was in 1985, 86, 87, that's 15, Jesus Christ, that's three decades? Yeah. Uh, we're still arguing it, okay? Because Falk is convinced it's anterior, and that therefore there was no reorganization in the brain. The reorganization of the brain had to come, in her view, after a major expansion in brain size. And that's what we've been arguing about all this time. Okay? We're still arguing about it. Okay? There was a recent paper by her and her colleagues in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in which she claimed that the Tong child had an open anterior fontanelle and the topic suture. That's another talk. Okay. Uh, bottom line is we find no evidence for an atopic suture or an anterior fontanelle when we do a micro CT scan of that fossa. You do find a remnant of the atopic suture right here in Gabella, where it always is. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. So we have a new find that came out around 2003, 2002, some, somewhere around there, called STW505. That's Stoughton West and the 505th fossil. And you, if you've taken any paleoanthropology courses, you know all about STS5. Okay, that was found in 1936. That's the one on the bottom here uh, that was found and worked on by Robert Broom, paleoanthropologist and dinosaur specialist, actually. Okay? I'm just putting these up to show you how close they are in terms of overall morphology. Okay? Because the undercast of STO, STW505 has an intact internal table of bone, and this is an undercast that was made for me by Ron Clark, um, one of the authors in our paper, 2004 paper. And what you can see here, then, ah, oh, no. Okay, can you see me moving this thing here? This red line? That is actually a perfect lunate sulcus. Okay? There's the transverse sinus going across. Uh, you can see where the occipital pole would be. The reconstruction is in yellow. And that is basically the mid-sagittal plane, plus or minus <laughs> a millimeter or two. You know. But the distance of that is 20 millimeters from the lateral edge of the lunate sulcus to what would be the mid-sagittal plane. Now, on the chimpanzee, almost all chimpanzees, that measurement is roughly 35 millimeters. Okay? That's, that's a lot, large amount. And those are on chimpanzee brains 
that are roughly maybe 350 to 385 cc's. STW 505 is roughly about somewhere between 550 and 600 cc's. So you have to scale a little bit to realize that 20 millimeters is, you know, moving back in the posterior direction. Okay. I put this up because I thought when we published this that that settled the issue. Here's 505 with a lunate sulcus in a posterior position. Should be the end of the debate, I thought. Nah, science doesn't work that way. Okay, you know, give me another 15 years and I'll keep answering that stuff. So here's an oblique view of it. Now you get a very good sense of that crescentic sulcus there. There's nothing else that makes that crescentic sulcus. I mean, scour your neuroanatomy textbooks and see if you can come up with something in that region that does that. I challenge you. Okay. Finally, I'm going to tell you where the lunate sulcus can't be found. Do you recognize any of these actors? This is the gorgeous and beautiful Elizabeth Verba, major paleontologist at Yale. Okay? I, when I was working in, at, in Pretoria at the same museum she was, I fell in love with her. Unfortunately, she was married. This is Philip Tobias, one of the major players in the whole Australopithecine and fossil hominid game. Elegant person. This is where the lunate sulcus is not. This is Bob Brain looking for something. We never did find out what it was that had him so preoccupied. Here. But as you can tell from Elizabeth's view, it must be something very important. <laughs> this is Alan Hughes, who worked uh, under Philip Tobias and was the main guy responsible for most of the technical details of making casts, you know, and keeping the lectures together and everything. He was a dear and close friend to me. So that's where the roommate so comes. Eight. Okay. Issues three and four. Okay. We can study cerebral asymmetries. As you probably are aware, the human brain is basically asymmetrical. It tends to grow in some sort of torque pattern. It's unclear whether the right grows faster than the left. I think it's the right growing somewhat faster. But nevertheless, uh, we are also handed animals. We're not poor preference animals. We're handedness. And that handedness is basically right-handed. Okay? And from all we know of genetics, all we know of many, many studies that have been done on frequencies and so forth, we're about 88 to 92% right-handed in most populations. Okay? That right-handedness is associated with what we call a patalia pattern, which is to say that you can look at the cerebral cortex and determine whether one side is larger than the other in the occipital parietal aspect or in the frontal lobe aspect. And that's sort of the classical way that it used to be done. So the classical association with right-handedness is that the left occipit protrudes more posteriorly and is sort of wider on the left side while at the same time, the width of the prefrontal lobe is somewhat wider on the right side. And this is what you find in, in most populations. Left-handers tend to go in the opposite direction, and ambidextrals uh, tend to have very little asymmetries and so forth, but can go in either direction. So the handedness thing is not 
100% established by the genome. It's more complicated. Nevertheless, this is sort of the basic pattern. Okay. This is KNM ER 1470. Kenya National Museum, East Lake, Goff, 1470. The 14th, 70th fossil found there during a season, uh, if I recall, back in the 70s somewhere, or in the late 60s. And you're looking at a dorsal view of the endocast. And uh, there is some distortion in it, but that distortion does not account uh, for these asymmetries. And that's been carefully studied. The cranial capacity of this early homo, uh, sometimes called uh, Homo rudolfensis, sometimes called a uh, different homo, uh, is about 1.9 million years and is 752 cc's. Roughly what you get at the low end of Homo erectus. Okay? And what you can see here, I hope, is that the left occipital really does protrude. Ah, God. Okay? Really does protrude more posteriorly than the right side. It's certainly clearly broader in this region. If you look. There we are. If you look at the right frontal patella, it's wider here than it is across here. So that, I think, establishes that in, by early homo times, you had some significant cerebral asymmetries that may have certainly had something to do with handedness. What it had to do with other cognitive functions, of course, we don't know. But it is sort of intriguing that you have this degree of asymmetry there. If you compare it to apes and so forth, you can find those patterns of asymmetry, but they are nowhere near as pronounced as they are in modern humans. Okay? And what we know of chimpanzees, bonobos, and so forth, you get occasional handedness, but mainly it tends to be preference, side preference, rather than true handedness. Now here are two Neanderthal specimens, Montechuchel and La Ferrisi. Uh The bottom one is La Ferrisi from France. And this is the dorsal view of it. It's kind of hard to see, but the left occipital region here is slightly more protruding. And it is slightly broader across here than it is on the right side. This is the mid-sagittal plane here, and the right breadth is slightly larger in this Neanderthal as well. Monte Cicero is just really far out, isn't it? I mean, look at this. It really does extend far more posteriorly. It's clearly much broader across here. And the right frontal, even though a little portion of it is missing, uh, is broader as well. So here are at least two good solid Neanderthal specimens that are showing a typical modern human asymmetry. And we think right-handed. Um, there's all nice work going on with stone tool making and so forth, which some people have suggested can tell us something about handedness in there, going way back to Achillean times, maybe before. But definitely, I think, in Neanderthal's case, uh, you'd be hard-pressed not to find out. I assume that sometime in the genomic future, 23 and me will be able to tell you uh, I'm 3.1% Neanderthal. Okay? Uh, you don't mind, do you? Anyway, maybe I'll find out whether I inherited my right hand in this from a Neanderthal. Exciting, right? Okay, okay here's the dorsal view of Monte Tercera because that other view wasn't very clear, perhaps. And this is the left occipital region and its parietal side here. And here is the right frontal going on. Just, just to make sure that we saw it. Okay. 
Issue five, the presence of asymmetry in Broca's caps. What are Broca's caps? Area 44, 45, I think 47 ought to be included in it because it has something to do with some aspects of phonation and speech. You know? Uh, and in modern Homo sapiens, it's very clear that there are asymmetries between left and right Broca's caps. If you see them even on the brain that's dissected, or you see them on endocasts that are made maybe from the virtual skulls and so forth. So the question is, if that is a modern characteristic, and we know something about the relationship of Broca's regions and prefrontal to human behavior, human moral issues, human control of urges, and so forth, then it becomes interesting to ask yourself, will the same thing occur in fossil hominids? This is Jebel Arud. Uh, the thing is reversed at the, at the present time. Uh, so the right brook The right Broca's cap is on the left side here. And I've only, I haven't measured it in surface area, uh, but I think you can make a good case that in fact the morphology and the size are different between right and left sides. This is K and M 1470 again, only this time is the reconstruction I made of the basal portion on a plaster cast. Okay, What you saw on the previous slide was the actual first endocast that was made from it, which is another lecture in its own right when I ex tried to explain to you uh, what was on Richard Leakey's face when he saw me doing it. Anyway, uh, there is clearly an asymmetry between left and right sides on this endocast going back one nine million years ago. Okay. So my, I think you can see what I'm getting at. I mean, I, some of the issues of reorganization really probably go back a long ways into the phylogeny of the Homo genus. Australopithecines are not showing us any real asymmetries so far, which is interesting in its own right. However, you know, almost all the endocasts we have, you know, are of one side or the other, or parts are missing, so it's an open story. We, are, we need more discoveries. Uh, there is a one from Indonesia called Sambang Luchan III. Uh, this was this incredible skull that was actually found uh, in Maxwell and Mandible, a shop, uh, uh, sort of a paleontological uh, gift shop uh, right next to the Museum of American Museum of Natural History. And the guy running it finally realized that he had in his collection, had bought from some trader, you know, this bone and it actually was Homo erectus. And it was finally traced to Sambon Macan three, and so forth. So this is the endocast of it, and my colleague Doug Broadfield very carefully positioned the right and left sides of Broca's caps on these, simply to show that they were asymmetrical in terms of size, nothing more. Okay? So that takes us up up to maybe 1.5, 1.4 million years ago, so forth. And we go further, we have it in Neanderthals, clearly. Okay, size and reorganization as mosaic. So there's different ways the brain can change through time. This is a time one, time two. Uh, you can go what I've sort of done is try to depict uh, a brain dorsally viewed with the mid-sagittal section and yeah, here, okay, mid-sagittal 
This might be the central sulcus going across, separating the frontal from parietal lobe. Oh, I tell you, this thing really sucks. Okay. Anyway, you go from time one to time two, and the whole brain has expanded pretty much, okay? So there's been no reorganizational changes, just an increase in size. Against the B, where you can see the central sulcus and the, and the lamboid, I mean the uh, lunate sulcus, really changing in terms of their relative proportions over in T time, time two. So this is what I would mean by a reorganizational event changing through time one to time two. What I think is happening between, let's say, apes and early Australopithecines. Okay? You can also change uh, the brain without changing its size, maybe its conformations and so forth, simply by maturing the fibers at different times and different rates and from different positions going across the corpus callosum, going anterior to posterior. This endocast will tell you nothing about. You can't find that out. But logically, it's, it's theoretically a possibility. And we've seen this, that it has happened. You get asymmetric hemispheric asymmetry, and you see I've drawn it in such a way Well, it's down here, the hell with it. Okay. Or, in E, you can get a whole difference in re neuroreceptor distributions. Now, you all know all that beautiful work that was done by uh, Incel on prairie voles and mountain voles and the incredible difference in their behavior patterns in terms of fetching pups uh, back to their nest or not. You know, if you look at the, at, you know, take the skull off, look at the brain, you're not going to be able to tell them apart, as far as I know. Okay, weigh them, they're going to be the same size. You look at the external morphology of a vole, not very exciting, but you're not going to see any differences between these two things. So you, you test for serotonin, and it just lights up totally different between the two species. And there is another aspect of reorganization, which we haven't quantified. But if you look at the receptor site differences, they're there. And here's a whole another way of thinking about reorganization and thinking about what you get out of comparative neuroanatomy. Okay? There's actually ways now of looking at brain differences between species that tells you something about internal organization. And I think that's where the future is really going very strongly. Okay, so what I'm saying is that by the time of A. afarensis uh, and A. africanus at about three and a half to three million years ago, uh, you have three specimens. I didn't, I didn't show you the one from afarensis, which is really strong. You, you've got changes in the reduction of primary visual strike, cortex area 17, and a relative increase in posterior parietal cortex. Okay? If you come up to about 2 million years to 1.9, then 1470 is showing us that we are also getting changes in the third frontal convolution, Broca's caps, and in the degree of asymmetries between left and right cortex. So these reorganizational changes are taking place at least between two and say 1.7 million years ago, okay? Homo habilis is beginning to show cerebral asymmetries. That's what I, I'm, it's really the 1470 endocast that shows that the most. And when you come to roughly 10,000, maybe 15,000 years ago, uh, one begins to find possibly refinements in the cerebral cortex, or at least that's what we think, but we cannot get that from the endocast. The endocast doesn't show that. So that's sort of a speculation on my part. Okay. Here are some of the major regions that are involved. I've, I've left out the prefrontal lobe with areas 10, 
and so forth because it's it's too complicated looking at the endocast to try and divine which of those areas is really 10 and which is 47 and so forth and so on but as you can see uh, a lot of the parietal cortex five seven Brobman areas, 39, 40, and then superior temporal cortex. Uh, all of these are tremendously important in terms of changes that might have taken place <coughs> in early hominid evolution. So the task is to hopefully get many more specimens in which you can actually have complete prefrontal cortices so that you might get a sense of how different 45 44, 8, 9, 10, and 46 were. At the time, we don't. Okay. Now these are a summary of size changes in the human brain. Uh, if you start at the beginning, you have a small increase, which I think was basically allometric, uh, between the two taxa afarensis and Australopithecus africanus. Uh, the africanus, the um, Afarensis specimens are just slightly larger than they are. Um, then you have Africanus to Homo habilis, and it's changing from roughly 400 cc's to maybe getting up to 700 cc's. Okay, a jump of 300. And that seems to be mostly non-allometric in terms of its, of its change. That is, from what we see of the body sizes of these two forms, they seem pretty much the same, but the brain size is clearly changing, so it's a non-allometric change. And as you come to Homo habilis to Homo erectus, uh, you get a very large increase, you know, and uh, that's a small allometric increase because there is an increase in size, body size, uh, between, let's say, Homo rudolfensis and Homo erectus. And from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, uh, you get almost no change whatsoever in terms of body size from what we know of the postcranial stuff, and yet there is a vast increase in the size of the brain. So what's happening through time is parts are going changing allometrically, other parts are sometimes changing non-allometrically, and this is what I mean by mosaic. I mean the the trail. And evidence from hominid evolution is one of mosaic changes through time. Okay. Now, there's been a small reduction in brain size uh, in, say, the last 15,000 years to the present, uh, which may well have been simply allometric. That is related to a reduction in body size. And we are sort of getting smaller. Except that in the Netherlands, where they're getting taller. Go figure. So this is the overall chart of what it looks like if you plot all the cranial capacities over millions of years ago. Uh, and as you can see, um, you have a trend starting at the right-hand corner and sort of going up in a parabolic curve fashion. But as I hope you can see, there's a tremendous amount of overlap of various sp specimens during that same period of time. I mean, Homo erectus here with these black triangles has an enormous amount of variation, which suggests perhaps that maybe they should be in different species and so forth. But that's a question of should it be Homo erectus, Homo ergaster, Homo rudolfensis, and so forth. And I refuse to get in those arguments. Okay. But this is basically what it looks like. Neanderthals tend to be up here. Homo sapiens, I, uh, I regard uh, Neanderthals as basically maybe a subspecies, if that, of modern Homo sapiens. I don't see it as a species difference. But that's, that's where I stand on it. Okay. So let's... Since I got this published, it was, it was okay for me to do that. Okay. Um, let me go back. Yeah, okay. So issue seven, 
Uh, what can we do now with Endocast? Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is increase our Endocast collections as much as possible. Um, so I've done well over 300 apes um, that are at, in the collection at uh, Columbia University. Unfortunately, most of those were done with latex rubber, and over the decades, latex rubber fails. It caramelizes, and so we're about to lose those endocasts. Uh, fortunately, they were CT scanned, and the scans exist at the University of Pennsylvania under the directorship of uh, Dr. Janet Monge. Okay. I went to the American Museum of Natural History, and uh, using silicone rubber, and if the skulls were sectioned, made endocast of roughly 80 modern homo sapiens uh, from all over the world, Tasmania, uh, Senegal, uh, tremendous numbers from Eskimos, and so forth and so on. It's a multi-ethnic collection, and it, the purpose for doing it is to find out how the morphometric variation of these endocasts exists. Okay. A good student that I had as an undergraduate is a woman by the name of Dr. Lynn Copes, uh, and she was interested in a study of robusticity of the skull and was able to collect about 600, 650, I think, CT scans from all around the world so that all, almost all of the Terry collection, which some of you will know about, was scanned. Uh, all of Point Hope Escobo, which is about 300 cases, it has been scanned. And I have made the virtual endocast of those uh, in a program called Analyze. So this collection is building and building and building, uh, and it's a part of my OCD uh, to continue to do that. Okay. So this exists. And this shows you what a picture of an endocast looks like, the basal portion. This happens to be a basal view of a chimpanzee. Uh, at the bottom, uh, you can see the prefrontal lobe and how sort of pointed it is. Uh, you can see small temporal lobes. Uh, and so it goes. I actually tried to do six views of each and do the measurements. So that's it. These are my colleagues. I'm told that questions are possible. Do we have time? Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Yeah. So you had mentioned earlier that uh, the older endocasts show gyro and sulky better than the more recent ones. Yeah. I'm just curious if you have a I don't, I, I really don't know. This whole issue of what will, uh, which gyri and sulky will imprint into the internal table of bone is, is, is ought to be researched far more carefully. We think that the basal portion imprints better than the dorsal surface, and that can be easily explained, I guess, through gravity more than anything else. Um, and why it happened with the Indonesian specimens in particular that you got such good gyrification in the frontal lobe is we don't understand the reason for it at all. Is there a difference between true fossils and actual bone? Do you get better? Not, yeah. not really. Uh, if, if, if the bone fossilizes and indurates properly, um, it, it will preserve the internal table of bone very nicely. Unfortunately, what happens with a lot of this stuff is you get a calcareous accretion inside the damn thing and that is almost impossible to take out. You know, uh, there's a fabulous uh, uh, Australopithecus robustus in Kenya, four, uh, specimen 406 from East Lake Rudolph, uh, which is a beautiful, robust Australopithecine skull, and it's, it's filled with rock. And I mean, I'm terrible. You know. I suggested to Richard that they implant a little stick of dynamite inside of it. 
and encapsulate it carefully, you know, they, they'd be able to glue it together again. You know, but we at least could get another endocast if we wanted to. Does that answer? Don't be so shy. Come on. Yeah. There is, there are some. Um, a major has one, uh, um, and there are just little fragments of, of other ones. Um, Egyptopithecus has some endocast material, and it was Len Radinsky who studied those back in the 70s and 60s. And that collection of his, by the way, is at the Field Museum in Chicago, and so that's where you would find those. I sort of gave up on, on those, but there are some endocranial portions uh, from these earlier animals. Unfortunately, it's extraordinary fragmentary. So, I mean, you, you, you could get a real true frontal lobe, let us say, from, from one of the anthropoids that might be related to either gorilla or chimpanzee. Yeah? Oh sure, uh, one of the one of the main uh, stars of paleoneurology was Tilly Edinger, and Tilly Edinger did the horse brain, and there was a monograph she did I think in forty seven or forty eight, uh, based on the endocast of the entire horse line, you know, starting from what, Eohippus, and then going up to Mercohippus, and then our our our, our good old horse now. And what she was able to show in the endocasts of those uh, was that there were not just size changes, but there were definitely reorganizational changes taking place. It's interesting because her father, Ludwig, was also a paleoneurologist in the 19th century and published mostly in German and so forth. So, yeah, other, others have. Um, uh, Wally Welker did a, an extremely beautiful thing on raccoons and did endocast the raccoons and they related them to the brain to show that each of the digits on the paw were represented by a, 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 a gyrus by itself. So this has been used in other lineages as well. No. I won't want to do it on reptiles particularly, but it, I suppose it could. And no, there are other people out there who have, who are working on this. Definitely. Boy, this 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 these people here are really great. Yeah, go ahead. I don't think much of it. Yeah, uh, uh, um, I don't. I don't think the musculature was really constraining in the growth of the brain. Uh, but that's all I can say. I mean, I see no. I've never seen any experimental evidence to indicate that that would be the case. You know, you know and as the brain is growing and enlarging, I mean, at that point. Uh, things are fairly plastic with regard to this the, the skull of the child, so I don't I don't think that's a, a good one. However, in terms of mutations, changing organization and growth factors in the brain, yeah, and maybe genomics, uh, as we get much closer to things, will answer those kinds of questions. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I think of human evolution, uh, I tend to think of, wow, you know, um, the, these early animals 
uh, didn't make a decision. I don't mean it that way, of course. You know, but somehow a decision was made to change the maturation rates and schedules in a very profound way. So that dependency of offspring on parents uh, really man manifested itself, I think, very differently from what might be a chimpanzee, pre-chimpanzee clade or something like that, to what you find certainly in early homo. So what that suggests is that to delay the maturation rates and so forth, uh, you probably had to d delay the schedules of myelinization in part, different parts of the brain. Now, how, how we can take that and then place it against selection pressures for particular aspects of behavior, I don't know how to do that. That would be purely speculative. But one can s sense scenarios in which it might be very useful to increase body size uh, and maybe sexual dimorphism as well between males and females if there is differences in economic activities and so forth. And that might precede some change in the brain. Or the change in the brain might have preceded that. You know, those are the kinds of things. But you have to understand that when I study these endocasts, I'm talking about Neanderthals where I might have five or six specimens. And if you sit down with what you've learned in, 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 in genetics, population genetics, then you know what NE is. It's essential population size. That population size, you know, in early times might have been 500, 1,000, maybe 5,000. The bottom line is when you get to it and you look at all the endocasts that exist up through Homo sapiens modern, that is the cutoff after, let's say, Cro-Magnon, you've got less than 100 specimens. And if you figure out what the total population of hominins might have been, you have sampled 0.000001% of that. So uh, it's it's humiliating, but it pays. <laughs> so.